I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. The thing about suburban life that no one wants to talk about is fake niceness. I talked about this in the previous episode. People waving at me from the street when they don't need to. I don't know them and they don't know me. But uh, they'll stare at me for a long time. And then I eventually, when I'm out on my deck reading a book or whatever, and I'll see them staring at me as they walk across the sidewalk, you know, a couple hundred feet away from me. And uh, it reaches a point where we're staring. Someone's got to break the staring, so I'll wave. And then they wave back. And uh, it's weird. It's a weird dynamic. It's disingenuous. It's uh, strange. Friday night, my brother-in-law came over. So we sat on the deck. We talked. And uh, reminisced about old times. We listened to Mishki on the radio, like we used to do back in the 1990s, and drank beer and chatted. But people walked by, and they'd stare at me, and I'd stare at them. And the staring would go for a good four to five seconds, until I finally raised my arm up, give a little wave. And then they always wave back. And if they're walking with someone, they'll poke the person they're next to and make a gesture to say that that guy waved at me. I don't understand it. So tonight, my friend John, uh, who I've known since high school, uh, he's kind of a rough-looking guy. He's got a big beard. He wears Harley Davidson shirts. He went to school to work on Harley Davidson uh, motorcycles and uh, realized there's no career in that once he finally got a job and realized, oh, you make no money at all doing this. And so he gave that up, and now he drives a truck. But he kept on to the Harley Davidson appeal, the aesthetic, the big beard, his uh, big old beer belly, uh, grubby clothes, that kind of thing. And he was sitting there, and he looks all intimidating, and he's on my deck, and we're chatting and talking, and people would look at us. And they'd walk by and do the four to five second stare, and eventually I'd wave. Then he'd say, the hell you doing? And I said, this is a thing that goes on. People just stare at me when they walk by on the sidewalk, and then I feel like I have to wave, and then they wave back, and they stop staring at me. It's like this weird dance that you got to do when you live in the suburbs and he said well that's ridiculous and i said well you're kind of scary and then the next time someone walks by why don't you do it so a few minutes go by and a couple walk by a young man and his uh, beautiful girlfriend slash wife but the man kept staring at us and i said oh see it's happening and then my friend John looked. He goes, oh my God, it is. I'm looking him right in the eyes and he's just staring back. I said, I know. They do this every time. It's never the same people twice. And I said, do it. So he raised his arm and he waved and the person waved back. And then he turned to the woman he's with and poked her and made a gesture towards that. That guy waved at me. And then uh, John said, yeah, there's something about this I kind of like. And I said, I know. It's weird, isn't it? Like it's a weird game you play. And, but in the end, everyone's supposed to be friends, right? It's disingenuous, but... And he said, yeah, no, I know. And as the night went on, more people came, and John waved at all of them. And that's my summer so far. Let's get into the story. Well, as always, let's learn about Samuel Langhorn Clemens, also known as Mark Twain, with some interesting fun facts from this website that's poorly translated. Uh, number eight, his possessions. He bought a typewriter of his own at $125, which would only type in capital letters, and also he possessed personal telephone, too. <laughs> so there you go. That's an interesting fun fact. Uh, they have related posts 
10 interesting, uh, interesting facts about Madonna, uh, which I think I should dive into. And let's learn about Madonna. Huh, million for ad. <laughs> she was paid about $5 million by none other than the giant Pepsi for their commercial, but it could not be aired because of over-the-top religious overtones, period. It was almost like her video, Like a Prayer. The big bosses of the soft drink giant thought it was best to pull out pull it out else it might hurt someone's sentiment and tarnish their brand. I'm thinking this is poorly translated from Japanese. Someone's got a fun fact Japanese website that must be doing really well and they thought, oh, let's just throw it into Google Translate and we can make an, uh, an English version. We're going to clean up there too. But it's not coming off so well. Well, with that, let's read the next chapter of uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Chapter 8 Tom, in all caps, dodged hither and thither through the lanes until he was well out of the track of returning scholars, and then fell into a, a moody jog. He crossed a small branch, in quotes, about two or three times because of a prevailing juvenile superstition that to cross water baffled pursuit. Half an hour later, he was disappearing behind the Douglas Mansion on the summit of Cardiff Hill, and the schoolhouse was hardly distinguishable, uh, away off of the valley behind him. He entered a dense wood, picked his pathless way to the center of it, and sat down on a mossy spot under a spreading oak. There was not even a, a zephyr stirring. The dead noonday heat had even stilled the songs of the birds. Nature lay in a trance that was broken by no sound but the occasional far-off hammering of a woodpecker and this seemed to render the pervading silence and the sense of loneliness the more profound. The boy's soul ah, was steeped in melancholy. His feelings were in happy accord with his surroundings. He sat long with his elbows on his knees and his chin in his hands, meditating. It seemed to him ah, that life was ah, but a trouble at best, and he more than half envied Jimmy Hodges, so lately released. It must be very peaceful, he thought, to lie and slumber and dream forever and ever, with the wind whispering to the trees and caressing the grass and flowers over the grave and nothing to bother and grieve about ever any more. If he only had a clean Sunday school record, he could be willing to go and be done with it all. But now as to this girl, what had he done? Ah, uh, Nothing. He had meant the best of the world, even treated like a dog, like a very dog. She would be sorry someday, maybe when it was too late. Ah, if he could only die temporarily. But the elastic heart of youth cannot be compromised into one constrained shape long at a time. Tom presently began to drift insensibly back into the concerns of his life again. What if he turned his back now and disappeared mysteriously? What if he went away ever so far away? into unknown countries beyond the seas, and never came back any more. Oh, how would she feel then? Ah, oh, the idea of being a clown recurred to him now, only to fill him with disgust. For frivolity and jokes and spotted tights were an offense. When they intruded themselves upon a spirit that was exalted into the vague, august realm of the romantic, no, he would be a soldier and return after long years, all war-worn and illustrious. No, better still, he would join the Indians and hunt buffaloes and go on the warpath in the mountain rages and the trackless great plains of the far west. And away in the future came back a great chief, bristling with feathers, hideous with paint, and prance into Sunday school some drowsy summer morning with a blood-curdling war-whoop and sear the eyeballs of all his companions with unappeasable envy. But no, ah, there was something gaudier even than this. He would be a pirate. That was it. Now his future lay plain before him and glowing with unimaginable splendor. Ah, how his name would fill the world and make people shudder. How gloriously ah, he would go plowing and dancing seas in his long, low, black-huddled racer, the spirit of the storm with his grisly flag flying at the fore, and at the zenith of his fame how he would suddenly appear at the old village and stalk into church, brown and weather-beaten, in his black velvet doublet and trunks, and his great jackboots, his crimson sash, 
his belt bristling with horse pistols, his crime rusted cutlass at his side, his slouch hat with waving plumes, his black flag unfurled with the skull and the crossbones on it, and here, with swelling ecstasy, the whisperings, ah, eh, oh, it's Tom Sawyer the pirate, the black avenger of the Spanish main. Yes, it was settled. His career was determined. He would run away from home and enter upon it. He would start the very next morning. Therefore, he must now begin to get ready. He would collect his resources together. He went to a, a rotten log near at the end of it and began to dig under one end of it with his barlow knife and soon struck wood. Uh, it sounded hollow, and he put his hand there and uttered his incantation impressively. What has it come here? Come! That's here. Stay here. Then he scraped the dirt away and exposed a, a pine shingle. He took it up and disclosed the shape of the little treasure house of whose bottoms and sides were of shingles. It lay, in it lay a marble. Tom's astonishment was boundless. He scratched his head with a perplexed air and said, Well, that beats anything. Then he tossed the marble away, uh, pettishly, and stood, uh, cod conjugating, stood conjugating. Let's see what that is. Kedjugate. Uh, formal or humorous to think deeply about something and meditate or reflect. All right, Kedjugate. The truth was that a superstition of his had failed here, which he and all his comrades had always looked upon as infallible. If you buried a marble with certain necessary, uh, necessary, ne necessary, okay, incantations and left it alone a fortnight and then opened the uh, place with the incantation he just was used, you would find that all the marbles you had ever lost had gathered themselves there. Meantime, no matter how widely they had been separated, but, but now uh, this thing had actually had unquestionably failed. But Tom's whole structure of faith was shaken uh, to its foundations. Now, he had many a time heard of this thing succeeding, but never its failing before. It did not occur to him that he had tried it several times before himself, but he could never find the hiding place afterwards. He puzzled over the matter some time, and finally decided that some witch had interfered and broken the charm. Now, he thought he would satisfy himself on that point, so he searched around till he found a small sandy pot with a little funnel-shaped depression in it. He let himself down and put his mouth close to this depression and called, eh, Doodlebug, Doodlebug, tell, tell me what I want to know, eh, Doodlebug, Doodlebug, tell me what I want to know. The sand eh, began to work, and presently a small black bug appeared for a second, eh, then darted again in a fright. It doesn't tell, so it was a witch that done it. I just noted. it. He well knew the futility of trying to contend against witches, so he gave up discouraged. But it occurred to him that he might as well have had the marble that he had just thrown away, and therefore he went and made a patient search for it. But he could not find it. So now he went back to his treasure house and carefully placed himself, just as he had been standing when he tossed the marble away. And then he took another marble from his pocket and tossed it away in the same, saying... Brother, go find your brother. He watched where it stopped. It went there and looked, but it must have fallen short or gone too far. So he tried twice more. The last repetition was successful. The two marbles lay within a foot of each other. Just there, a blast of toy tin trumpet came faintly down the green aisles of the forest. Tom flung off his jacket and trousers and turned a suspender into a belt raked away some brush behind a rotten log, disclosing a, a rude bow and arrow, and a lath sword and a tin trumpet, and in a moment he had seized these things and bounded away, bare-legged, with fluttering shirt. He presently halted under a great elm, blew an answering blast, and began to tiptoe and look warily out, this way and that. He said cautiously to an imaginary company, "'Hold, my merry men!' Keep hid uh, till I blow. Now appeared that uh, Joe Harper, yeah, and as uh, airily clad and elaborately armed as Tom. Tom called, Hold, who comes here to my Sherwood Forest without my pass? Guy of Gisborne wants no man's pass. Who art thou that 
that dares to hold such language, said Tom, prompting as they talked, by the book from memory. Uh, who art thou that dares to hold such uh, language? I, indeed, I am Robin Hood. As thy uh, caitiff uh, carcass suit shall know, ah, then thou art indeed that famous outlaw. Uh, right gladly I will dispute with thee the passes of the merry wood have at thee. Ah, they took their lath swords, dumped their other traps on the ground, and struck a fencing attitude, ah, foot to foot, and began a grave, careful combat. Uh, two up and two down. Presently, Tom said, Now, if you've got the hang, uh, go it lively. So they, quote, went it lively, panting and perspiring with the work. And uh, by Tom shouted, Fall, fall, why don't you fall? I shan't. Why don't you fall yourself? You're getting the worst of it. Why, that ain't anything. I can't fall. And ain't that the way it's in the book? Yeah, the book says with the, with the black-handed uh, stroke and the slew the poor guy of guys born. Now you, you turn around and let me hit you in the back. Well, there's no getting around the authority, so Joe turned and received the whack and fell. Now, said Joe, getting up, you've got to let me kill you. That's fair. Well, why well, can't do that? It ain't the book. Well, it's a blamed, uh, it's blamed mean, that's all. Well, say, Joe, uh, you can't be Friar Tucker, much of the miller's son, and lame and be uh, with a quarterstaff, or I'll be the sheriff of Nottingham, and you'll be Robin Hood a little while and kill me. This was satisfactory, and so these adventures were carried out. Then Tom became Robin Hood again and was allowed the treacherous nun to bleed his strength away as a neglected wound. And at last, Joe, representing a whole tribe of weeping outlaws, dragged him sadly forth, gave his bow into his feeble hands, and Tom said, hey, Where's where the arrow falls? Uh, there bury poor Robin Hood under the greenwood tree. Then he shot the arrow and fell back, and it would have died. But he lit a little on a nettle and sprang up too gaily for a corpse. The boys dressed themselves and hid their accoutrements and went off grieving that there were no outlaws anymore and wondering what modern civilization could claim to have done to compensate for their loss. They said they would rather be outlaws a year in Sherwood Forest than President of the United States forever. Well, like always, that chapter was short. Short and punchy. Real punchy and short. And I love it. So much better than the time I had to read uh, the picture of Dorian Gray. That still hangs in my mind as a, a torture that I couldn't seem to get away from. That book went on forever. Oh, and the author was so into himself. And the way he wrote, you could tell he was into himself. And... And he hated Jews. Oh, he hated them so much. He was constantly referring to them in the most unflattering way. This book uh, is delightful. Children playing and scrapping and yelling and whatnot. Uh, Huck Finn's pretty racist. The N-word is being thrown around pretty liberally for a, a paragraph or two there. But uh, beyond that, not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Well, what do we learn here? Or trying to tie it into the thing I said earlier. Uh, I was talking about neighbors waving. Because they don't trust you and I don't trust them. Uh, I don't know how to tie it in here. Well, maybe Huck Finn, faced with uh, becoming engaged to a woman he just does not love, decides to delve into the world of paganism and fantasy. Uh, he's talking to bugs, pulling up marbles, uh... Uh, then he winds up uh, pretending he's a pirate and uh, fantasizing about being uh, about dying at a young age or disappearing and joining the military, which is something I hope pays off later. I'm pretty sure he fakes his own death, or was that Huck Finn? I'll never know. So maybe I should do the same thing. I'm dealing with a furlough this week. Uh, I've ordered a giant dumpster to come to my house. I'm going to tear up my deck, and uh, that's going to take a day or two. Throw it all in the dumpster with a bunch of other wood from a fence I tore down a while back. And instead of fearing 
uh, my work situation. Uh, I could pretend that I'm a small Mississippi boy tearing up his deck because my aunt told me to do it. And maybe I could talk other people into joining me uh, like he did with the painting of the fence. I don't know. I'll figure out how to work this. But I'm thinking the world of fantasy for me is the way to go. So with that, uh, thanks for listening. And I will be talking to you again later this week.